Now, one of the beauties that the Holy Spirit showed us in, in our, our series on the favor of God, that honestly, it opened up what the favor of God is all about to me, uh, was the fact that the favor of God is not just about convenience, um, uh, just making certain things easier per se, or you know, getting a good parking places or, or not having to wait in line at certain places. Uh, it, it's more than just the convenience of things for you, but that it's literally an essential thing in our lives. Um, I, I believe at, at levels, and he, Psalm 91 tells us in many areas, that the favor of God is a matter of life and death. You don't, you don't walk in the favor of God and, and you can be cut short. Uh, in your life, you need to make sure that you have the favor of God operating in you. Um, matter of fact, we, we looked at, uh, at one point in there, we were talking about dreams and, and assignments that God gives you and how the favor of God is essential in getting you to those dreams. When you look at Joseph and you look at, uh, that, that his brothers, uh, that God gave him a dream. And that if he would not have operated in the favor of God, he would have stopped short of those dream, the dream, the manifestation, a long time. He, he wouldn't have made it out of the pit. He would have been thrown in the pit, been eaten by, uh, by uh, the wildlife out there in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the desert. Or his brothers would have killed him. But the favor of God sustained him. The favor of God put him in that, that caravan to take him back to Egypt, to sell him to Potiphar. Uh, to put him into the prison and to, and, and to escalate him and to elevate him into the, the, the palace. It was the favor of God that caused him to see his dreams, to see his giftings, to see his callings, to see the, the, the final result come to pass. It was the favor of God. So we need the favor of God. Again, some people say, ah, things are going good. I got a good job, got a good wife, got, got, got good kids. Uh, favor, you know, I've got enough favor going on. I don't have to wake up every morning thinking about the favor of God. Yeah, you do. It's for your protection. It's for your safety. So again, read Psalm 91 and understand that that's what the favor of God does for you. We, it is a necessity in our lives. Now, to get a good picture of what we're going to talk, what we're talking about today, um, <laughs> I got this picture in my mind. Um, how many? Uh, have ever watched the movie Tommy Boy? All right, yeah. Uh, a lot of a lot of younger people nowadays don't know who Tommy the movie Tommy Boy. My kids know Tommy Boy, and I think they probably have influenced others around them. Uh, but they knew it because it was their dad's favorite movie. Still is. I love it. Tommy Callahan was his name, and uh, and uh, and I just, I just absolutely love that movie. It's funny. It's uh, but um, but there's one scene in and if anybody's ever uh, seen it, where him and a girl are out on on his sailboat, and uh, and and it's just a very calm, beautiful day up in uh, what was it Ohio, Sandusky, Ohio, and there's no wind, and he's out in the middle of this little lake on a sailboat and just sitting there. And, of course, the humor of it is he's a big guy, and so the boat's sitting like this. But, uh, but, but he's on a sailboat in the middle of the lake going nowhere. And, of course, their conversation's awkward because he's, he just keeps bringing up, wish there was some wind, wish there was some. Um, but, he, but, but the purpose of a sailboat and to move a sailboat is to utilize the wind to drive you to where you're going. Amen. You, th th there's got to be wind. There's got to be something moving you towards your destination. And, uh, and again, where the wind blows or how the wind blows does not determine where you go. The wind is just used as your power, as your source for driving you. The key to take you to where you're going is the rudder and the sail. It's the boat. If you don't have control of the rudder and the sail, which again, I could go in there and go some types. that the, James talks about the rudder being the mouth, the tongue. 
Uh, your sails is what catches the spirit. So you could, or the wind. So that could be your spirit man. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of pictures that we could show in there. But if we can just simply understand that the wind blows you, if you just let the wind blow, it'll take you wherever it intends to take, just take you off course. But when you get control of the rudder and the sails, you can use the wind that is blowing at you to take you to your destination. Amen. You you get you get people out there on the on the high seas. You know, if you ever watched a pirate movie, and they they functioned mostly by the sails, by those big sails they let up. And they didn't have to wait for the, for the well, we're going to have to go 600 miles off course until the wind decides to change, uh, to blow us back to where we're going. No, they just changed the sails. They would just change course. They would move the rudder. And they'd get going where they wanted to go because they were in control of where they went, not the wind. Now, today, if we can hold on to this illustration... And understand that the sailboat is you. It's you. You're going somewhere in life. The rudder and the sails are what we would understand more as our, as our mouth, our faith, our heart, our, our, our spirit man, our attitudes, our soul. It's the makeup of the man. And if we can understand as the winds being what drives you. Now, now again, we're going we're to look at two different things that, that can drive you. But it's still your choice where you go. All right? Now, again, some people say storms, the, uh, the winds and all that kind of stuff are bad things. But I, I want to show you it a little bit different. Because even favor is intended to draw us closer to God. Intended to draw us closer into our destiny. Say destiny with me. Hallelujah. Favor is to move us into our destiny. That's what we've been teaching on. That was one of the great... I hope you got, got a hold of that piece of revelation in our series. It's to drive us into our destiny. But if we allow the storms of life... Or if we allow favor, and we'll show it to you in a little bit, that people allow favor because they don't have control of their rudder. They don't have control of the sails. And so favor, if you don't understand what it's for, will drive you off course. But the winds will dictate where you go instead of you, and therefore you will not make it to your destination. What you do directs how favor and the storms affect you. Both are used. You catch that, that, that line? What you do directs what the favor of God and what the storms, how they affect you. Both are used. I, I, listen to this. Both favor and storms are used to take you to your destination. To take you to your destiny, to your assignment. But if you allow them to do, if you don't use them correctly, they will take you off course. And you're going to miss what God is wanting to do in your life. Now let's go over to 1 Kings chapter 3. We're going to start here as one of the big illustrations that I want to show you here. That, that, uh, that we have to guard ourselves in favor of God. Um. 1 Kings chapter 3, we understand that Solomon inherited the throne after his daddy, David, died. Um, so Solomon was intended to uh, build a temple. You remember, it was Solomon's temple. Uh, David, David wanted to more than anything. David, David, that's all he ever desired to do was to, was just to build the temple because he loved God so much. But God said, hey, look, man, you've just been a man of war. You have killed, you have killed, you have, you have done all that stuff to clear the way. And so because you have blood on your hands, you're not going to be able to, one to, to build, the, uh, build the temple. But we're going to let your son Solomon be the one. 
And so remember at the end of of of, of First Corinthians, uh, First Chronicles 29, where where David goes, I may not be able to build it, but I'm going to be the reason it gets built. And he brings the big offering and and and, and brings the big supply. Well, then Solomon gets into the position. David passes away, and and again the enormity of leading millions of of Israelites uh, hit Solomon. And here in verse 4, 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 4, it says, And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. A thousand burnt offerings did Solomon offer upon upon the altar. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I'll give to you. Now, I'm not going to get into this all today. This was the first time that we see Solomon giving a major offering. Uh, we see two other times, which, which again, uh, climaxed in the fact that the glory of God filled the temple. Remember, when he gave so much that it wasn't, they were unable to count it all, um, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. I, I want to say it's chapter 9. Uh, could be chapter 8, but, uh, but the glory of the Lord filled the temple so greatly that the priests that were ministering and doing things in the temple just dropped to the floor and couldn't even stand up because the glory of the Lord was so heavy. So in other words, you're, you might think your offering has nothing. I'm just going to give an offering. No, his offering here gave them a blank check before God. And it drove him to giving more. Until one time... And, and again, it wasn't, it, it, there was more. There was, there was a lot of glory that came his way, financial glory, because we'll see in, in verse chapter 10, which we'll read here a little bit in a second, um, he, he, has, he has kings and, and princes and rulers of other nations pouring into him, giving him gifts. So, so all, all it did was when he kept giving greater and greater and greater God's blessings, the favor of God came on him more and more and more. But he's, he comes and he gives an offering of a thousand sacrifices. And, uh, and, and God gives him a dream in the middle of the night and says, Solomon, whatever you want, I'm going to give you. And, uh, and so we understand, I'm, I'm for lack of time, uh, maybe it's going to take me more time to explain it than to actually read it. Uh, but, but we understand that, that Solomon said, man, I need wisdom to rule these people. I need understanding on how to how to function and do what's right, and, and so it, so in verse ten, God's response to that, it says, and the speech, his answer pleased God, that Solomon had asked this thing, and God said unto him, because thou hast asked this thing and hast not asked for long life for yourself or riches for yourself, nor have you asked for the life of your enemies. But you've asked for, for understanding and discernment to judge. I know I'm not reading it word for word. I'm just kind of doing the Fed Cali paraphrase. But <laughs> Verse 12, Behold, I will give you what you asked for. Now again, some people might think, well, so he wouldn't have given it to him? No, God's a faithful God. He would have given to that, but he would have lacked other things and his rulership would have been short. Because he wouldn't have had the wisdom to rule. But now he had the wisdom, and when he got the wisdom, God gave him everything else. God said, uh, I, I, I will do according to your words. I'll give you the wisdom and understanding. Uh, I'll just read what it says. I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart, so that there is none like thee before you, and none will rise after you like unto thee. And I have also given you that which you have not asked for. I'm giving you riches and splendor, honor, so that there will not be any among the kings like unto you in your day. There will be not one king that will be able to look and say, I got more than Solomon got. I'm more successful than Solomon was. Now, beloved, I don't know about you. If that does not qualify as the favor of God, I don't know what is. God says, hey, hey, Solomon, I'll give you anything you want to have. Open check, whatever you want. And he goes, I want wisdom. And he goes, I like that answer, so I'm going to give you more. That sounds like favor to me. That sounds like God doing something for Solomon that, that maybe is not as widely 
pursue. He's saying, Solomon, I'm going to make you the most wealthy king more than anybody else, any other king of your time. This qualifies as the favor of God. Solomon received and walked in the favor, and again, it was instigated because of his offering. Beloved, do not underestimate the power of your seed. Hallelujah. Uh, can, I, can I throw that out one more time? See if I can get some agreement on that. Do not understand, underestimate the power of your seed. When you sow a seed, beloved, you can say, I'm sowing this seed for this. And if it's a right thing to sow for, God, it just unlocks God's favor. How many have ever heard your pastor say, you don't want God filling up your bathtub? Because once he gets going, he doesn't know when to stop. And this is proof of it. He said, you want wisdom? I'll give you wisdom. And I ain't stopping there. I'm going to give you honor. I'm going to give you splendor. People are going to look at you, and they're going to come to you, and they're going to pick your brain because you have so much honor among the people, among the other kings. Kings are going to come to you, and we're going to read about it here in a second. Kings are going to come to you and ask you your secret. And you're going to be able to promote Israel, promote the covenant-keeping God of Israel. And see, here's the thing, is that those, those, those other nations, they were separated from God. But we, we all know that there were ways to have them come into the covenant and participate and to, and to receive the same inheritance and become Jewish nationalities, become in cooperation with them. He was going to make it to where people all around, all the Gentiles of that time would know who God is, would know his power, and could honor him the same way Josh, uh, Solomon honored him. Hallelujah. I like this. I hope you're getting this. Something. I know y'all just soak in a lot of stuff, and that's okay. So go over to verse 10, uh, chapter 10. So this is one account of one of the rulers, the Queen of Sheba, coming and visiting him. And it tells us that she came for a couple reasons. She came, first of all, to see his wealth. And remember, I believe it's in verse 5 of 1 Kings chapter 10, that it says that when she saw his wealth, she saw the manner of how people ascended into the temple and came down to the, you know, and, and went in and out and did all that kind of stuff, that she just fainted. It overwhelmed her. This, this was the king. It says up here, and now again, I'm just I'm throwing this in here. In, in verse 10, she brought a certain amount of talents, but uh, I think 9,000 pounds of gold in order to get answers. It amazes me how people come to church and they have, they have questions. I wish pastor would answer questions. I, I, want, I just have this question and they come empty handed. The queen knew the questions I want are not coming cheaply. They're not cheap answers. The answers I get are going to be answers that are going to propel me and escalate me to where Solomon is. And so I'm not going to come empty handed. She came with nine thousand pounds of gold. Doc, how much is gold right now? Do you know? For, for what? An ounce. Seventeen hundred an ounce. So you don't even have to do the math to understand 9,000 pounds of gold is a little bit, huh? It's a lot of money. I did the calculations and I, it's a lot of money. That's, I, and that's free of charge. I'm, just, I'm giving you that, that revelation free of charge. I have found people that sow more have greater understanding. 
They understand things. They receive more from sermons. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that be. <laughs> but she came and she wanted to find out his wealth, see if it's true, see how true it is, and she wanted to come and test him with some hard questions. She needed some answers. So she comes, she sees what's going on, she sits at his feet, or she sits before him and gets answers, and then in verse 9, she proclaims something. And I believe as much as, as much as she was from a foreign country, I believe what she proclaimed was inspired by God. I believe God put these words in her mouth. But listen to what she said in verse 9. <clears throat> she said, Blessed be the Lord thy God, which delighted in thee. Now that word delighted, and there's a lot of levels to it, but in one translation it said... Um, which highly favored thee. So this goes back to the favor of God. And so she said, So blessed be the Lord thy God, which highly favored you, to set you on the throne of Israel. Now I want you to see that there, that she recognized that there was a favor of Yahweh upon Solomon's life. That why he had, what he had, had everything to do with the favor of God on his life. Now notice this. Because. You know what the word because means, right? It explains to you why what was just spoken was just spoken. If I I sit there and I look at Jessica and I say, Jessica, I love you because. She's now going to get A or a list of reasons that I love with it. It'd be a list. It'd be a long list. She's now going to get a list of reasons why I love her. So in here when it says, you've been highly favored of God to lead and to sit on the throne of Israel because there's a reason why God has favored him. Now notice that it says, because the Lord loves Israel. God has favored Solomon. He has delighted in Solomon. He has given Solomon wealth. He has given Solomon wisdom. He has given Solomon all the stuff because of the favor, but because the reason, because he loves Israel. Now listen here. This is, this is, I want you to get a hold of this. This goes into what we've been talking about with favor. Favor is for you to enjoy. But the purpose of favor is to get you to your destiny. To get you to what you've been called to do. To what you've been called to establish. God favored Solomon because he loved Israel. And Solomon was the king of Israel. And God said, I need to favor Solomon to accomplish prosperity, wealth, increase, and and, and more than enough in Israel. And I, 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 I want to make sure this gets across to you. The favor was on him, not just for convenience, not just so he could sit back and, 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 and sit in with his harem and have his wives come one by one by and just tell him how much they loved him. He had the favor of God to achieve and to, to, to finish his destiny. destiny. When God works on your behalf with the favor of God, whether it be for a raise, whether it be for a promotion, a new job, whether it be for health, whether it just be for a new car, What God is doing, He's saying, I am qualifying, I'm preparing you, I am setting you up for your destiny. To fulfill your calling. To fulfill your destiny. To fulfill what I I have placed in your heart to do. To fulfill your assignment. Whoo! I I told you. I told you this is good. If you, if, you, if you haven't thought it was good, you need to go back and listen to it again. 
<laughs> Hallelujah. But see, here, 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 now here's where, remember how we started about the sailboat? The sailboat's you, and that there's winds, and it's the rudder. It, the winds don't declare where you go. It's the rudder and the sails that declare where you go. It's the boat. It, 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 it's you. It's your, it's your attitude. It's your heart. It's your spirit. It's your soul. It's your mindset. It's your tongue. That's what, de- that de- what determines where you go. The favor of God can many times drive people, because they enjoy the favor of God, but that it'll drive people to manufacture more favor upon themselves. Remember, one of the points that we made was don't, uh, don't compromise in your favor. Don't take shortcuts and don't, get, don't go cut. It's, it's, let God be your source of your favor. But a lot of times, when the wind of favor blows your way, how about this? Promotion. Raise. Significant raise. And you come and you testify in church. I got a raise. And because this raise, you realize you can now afford to go buy that boat you've been wanting. And so now you're working the five, six days during the week, extra hours, so you can't quite make it to church on Wednesday. And on Sunday, you've been favored, and so you want to have a little bit more favor and go out and spend some time on the lake. Now, there's nothing wrong with working hard. There's nothing wrong with having a boat. I'm just simply saying that when you start manufacturing and allowing the favor of God to blow you away from Him, away from relationship, and away from your destiny, there's a problem with your rudder and there's a problem with your sails. Hallelujah. Go to 1 Kings 11. I want to show you here something that happened to Solomon. Because there is absolutely no doubt that God said, God said, I, I, have, I have favored you. And he, and he spoke it through the Queen of Sheba. So he, that she was the queen, she didn't know. Oh, God used the mouths of donkeys to speak truth. And, and, and he had favored Solomon for Israel's sake. So that Israel would be the center point. Israel would be the, the, the focal point of that region. That, that, that the world would come to Israel for wisdom. They'd come to Israel and they would connect with the God of covenant. That's why. But notice here, verse 1. But King Solomon loved many strange women. I've only loved one strange woman. <laughs> he loved many strange women together with the daughter of Pharaoh, princess, women of Moab, Amorites, Edomites, Zidonians, Hittites. The Amplified Version helps you us a little bit. It says, but King Solomon defiantly loved many foreign women. So it wasn't as strange that Jessica is, but it's foreign. Um, <laughs> Pastor Elise is between me and her, so I know Pastor Elise has got my back. So <laughs> if she charges the platform. I might have to. <laughs> <laughs> now again, some of y'all go, so, oh, but Pastor Thad, polygamy was, was accepted back then. They, they allowed polygamy and, you know, things, you know, kings always would have more than one wife. You're not seeing what's happening here. See, the, the custom of that day was is that rulers, kings or their princes, their, their children, but, but kings often would be the ones that would marry the daughters of other kings to form an alliance and peace between the two countries, the two nations. And so what we're seeing here actually was not a problem necessarily of promiscuity. I wanted to sleep around. But he enjoyed all he had, and he didn't want any of these kings to start infiltrating and coming and trying to take his stuff. And so 
in having favor, that favor with an uncontrolled rudder or sail blew him and said, I want to create more favor for myself. More count. And God, we know God warned. He do not intermarry. Do not do it. Don't do it with, with, with other nations. But not only was he intermarrying with them, he was intermarrying for a purpose of peace. Even though he was serving and enjoying the favor of the Prince of Peace. Isn't that something? He was marrying to enjoy the favor of other kings. <laughs> this, this is good. And I know some of y'all going, uh, no, this is, we're, we're going to finish this. Jessica doesn't believe me because I'm seven, I, it's only six pages. So it's not bad. But this is, this, so I got to get done with it. So y'all need to just quiet down for a second. He was trying to manufacture peace. He was trying to manufacture more favor. No, no, no. See, um, We'll get along well with all of them. Do you not think the God who lined your pockets and built your buildings and, and, and made you so wealthy and had a queen bring 9,000 9, pounds of gold to your door? Spices, they say. She brought so many spices, which again, I, I accept that he was a king, that... There never was a time recorded that there was ever more spices ever brought than what she brought to Solomon, Queen of Sheba. God was taking care of him. God was providing for him. God was doing everything necessary because he loved Israel. But Solomon loved the favor so much that he started generating his own favor, working on his own counterfeit favor. And what I understand is that this counterfeit favor actually took Israel into bondage for 300 years. That it, it took them 300 years to get themselves out of that bondage because of that counterfeit favor. And again, I think I, it's just a good illustration. I know I have people in here wanting to buy boats, so I'm not, pre, I'm not saying this because of you guys. I'm just simply saying that there are people that try to, there's nothing wrong with the boat, but don't let it drive you away from what God's doing. God's got a destiny for your money. I just got a raise. I can spend more money on me. You can. Or you can honor the one who, who, who gave you that raise. All right. But you see how favor can work against you. The same thing happened. With, with, go over to Genesis chapter 3. Favor is not designed to stop you. Favor is not designed to be the end. Favor is designed to fill your winds, or to fill your sails, and drive you to your destiny. Genesis chapter 3, verse 4. The serpent said, well, and we know what Adam and Eve had got. Whew, my goodness. I don't think you could ever create a picture, a movie that would fully satisfy what the Garden of Eden was. Because they had put a lot of flowers or a lot of fruit trees, and it was way beyond that. It was, it was, it was the finest gold were the rocks of the Garden of Eden. It was, I mean, it was, it was extraordinary. It was the favor of God. But then the serpent showed up. Now, here's the thing. Here's what I'm, I'm talking to you about. The, enemy, the serpent showed up and said, you're not going to die. You're surely not going to die. He, confer, he, 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 he went against what God had told them. For God doth know in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open. You'll be as God's, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes, she already had favor, but she wanted something a little bit more. She wanted to create. She figured, if I can eat this and have some doors open to me, if God's been holding back a little bit on me. What was God ever holding back? Literally, literally, 
You can eat of any of the trees of the garden save one. What was he holding back on them? He was holding back evil. But she wanted to pursue extra favor, man-made favor, when eat it. And again, man now, 6,000 years later, still working its way out. The favor of God. Well, I, can I just throw this one in here again? The last Adam was offered the same chance to create some counterfeit favor, and he didn't take it. And he redeemed us from that curse. Favor is to drive us deeper into what we've been designed to accomplish. It's found in intimacy and relationship with God, driving us closer to God. If the favor drives us away from God, away from our destiny, then you've misused what God has blessed you with. Solomon's favor was for Israel to increase. Adam and Eve's favor was for mankind to increase. Your favor is to manifest your destiny to change your sphere of influence. I don't use sphere very much, but I thought that that says a lot. Your favor is for you to manifest your destiny to change your sphere of influence. In other words, the favor on Pastor Thad, the favor of God on Pastor Thad is not to stop with Pastor Thad because then I've misused it. But it's to affect everybody that's around me. It's to affect Moorhead. I hope you're getting it. Inside of me, I'm just jumping for joy. Praise God. This is, this is some good stuff. Let, 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 prove, let, again, I'm not, let's not turn there for time's sake. But in John chapter 12 is, is the time where Mary was anointing Jesus with perfume. And she poured the perfume on him. And all the perfume that was poured on him was meant for who? For him. Matter of fact, later on, remember, he said there was a purpose that was bigger than me on reason why she did it, but every bit that was poured on her was on him, meant for him. But when Mary walked out of that room, what did she smell like? What did every one of those disciples have stuck in their nose for days after that? That perfume. Because the favor that was on him gets on everybody around you. It's your sphere of influence. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Whew. Don't let your favor stop with you is what I'm saying. All right. Now, here, here's where I'm going I'm to shift here a little bit because, again, favor can blow you to your destination. But there's another thing that the enemy stirs up. Pastor Lisa taught on it one, uh, the, the first time she spoke on, on video about the storms, about the winds. And winds can start kicking up, and, and, and the enemy can bring storms and can bring things in your life. This is what I'm telling you. This is what I told you. This is, this is really well-timed simply because of we just came out of talking about favor and, and based on things that have been going on around us. But a lot of times, winds can kick up that are contrary to us, the winds of adversity. Go over to Exodus 13. I, I want to just share a couple of scriptures. I've I got to do my best to keep moving quickly here because I really want to get to the last point because the last point is going to really unlock some stuff in you for us all. It helped me out yesterday, and I'm telling you that. Exodus chapter 13, verse 17. It says, and it came to pass. Now, this is they've just been released. Pharaoh just let people go, all right? And God is getting ready to send them to the promised land. And the straight direction would have been right through the Philistine territory. But if they would have went straight through the Philistine territory, they would have had to face war right off the bat. And God did not want them to face full-fledged battles. He wanted them to learn to trust him. And so it says, And it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God led them not through the way of the Philistines, although it was closer for God said, lest peradventure the people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt. So in other words, there are winds of adversity that will blow on you 
that if you allow them to, will take you right back. See, without, without, without controlling the rudder, without controlling the sail, the wind will take you where the wind wants you to go. So when the winds of adversity start blowing, uh, if you are not in control of your rudder, if you're not in control of your sail, it'll blow you right back to the shore. It'll blow you to a different shore. It'll, it'll blow you hundreds of miles off course. It'll take you where it wants to go. But when you control the thing, the winds, by the rudder, by the sail, it'll take you still to your destination. And God was saying, listen, if we leave Egypt and immediately are faced with another nation going against us and trying to take us out, there's a good chance that that wind of adversity will take us. Let's go back to Egypt because at least we didn't have to fight wars. It stunk. It was horrible. But at least we didn't have to. And, and they would have been further from their destiny. So he said, we're going to take them the way of the Red Sea. Now, the beauty of that is that the way of the Red Sea, they still had, a, they still had an obstacle. It wasn't like it, God, because God was teaching them, trust me. It was still a wind, but it wasn't gale force. It was a wind that they had to learn to adjust the sails. Now, they didn't do very well on it. That's why they got stuck 40 years in the wilderness. How many people head back to bondage because of the battles and the trials they face? The things that don't go how they think they should have gone. They know they were created for something greater, but they keep running into battles. And again, it's because they, don't, they haven't learned how to control the sails and control the rudders. These battles between, uh, these battles, these winds of adversity are in between you and your destiny. Your sail and your rudder will determine if you get there. Psalm 66, verse 12. says, Thou hast caused men and allowed men to ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water, but you brought us out into our destination. There were some fires, there were some waters, there were some winds that blew in between. But we kept our rudders, we kept our sails, we kept the Spirit leading us. And we still ended up at our destination. Go to Mark chapter 4. Hallelujah. I, I, I may just have to skip ahead here because I, I really don't know when I started. But I do not know I started today. So I'll try to end today. Uh, hallelujah. I'm not that far from where I just, the last thing, is, I think it's going to help us all. I really do. But Mark chapter 4, verse 35. Because here, here's the thing is that when Adam and Eve were in the garden, the first thing the devil did was said, it's not what he said. Started getting to question the word of God. How about this? And I, I know I have this for later, but I'm going to throw it in here. Matthew chapter 3, where, where Jesus is baptized. Remember the last thing God said? This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. It's the last thing he said. Then he went into the wilderness... The first thing that the devil said to Jesus, the first thing he said to him is, if you are the Son of God. First thing he did was try to get him to question what he had heard the Father say. That's what the winds come. The winds come and start blowing and try to steal the word that was given to you. Tries to get your mind and your, your emotions and your thoughts on the, what, what's going on around you. What, what you've heard around here, not what you've heard in here. That's been his plan 
precious beginning. And literally the beginning. But notice here, Mark 4, 35. And the same day when the evening was come, he said to them, let's see if nothing comes up, we'll go to the other side. He said, let's go to the other side. So where were they going? What was the word that was spoken to them? We're going to the other side. And when they had sent him, uh, uh, when they sent away the multitude, they, they took him even as he was in the ship, and there was also with him some other little ships, and there arose a great storm. Again, the, 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 the winds of adversity kicked up. And it was a storm that scared them. Fear. A great storm, and the waves beat against the ship and started filling the ship up. Again, it's not the water around the ship that's going to be your problem. It's the water that gets in the ship that's your problem. And Jesus was under the bottom part of the ship, sleeping. Uh, what a picture on a pillow. You, you know in those days, often they used rocks. If they were just out on the, on the road going, they'd lean against a rock. Have you ever seen any cowboy movies? They'll get cozied up to a rock, and I'm like, I couldn't cozy up to a rock. <laughs> but how comfortable was Jesus in the middle of the storm? He was on a pillow. <laughs> I just, yeah, all right. I shouldn't really take that long on, on that one, but. And they woke him up and prayed. Now, you, again, technically they did pray because they asked Jesus for something. So technically. I know they weren't official, and I know they weren't correct on it, but if you're, again, their prayer was fueled by panic, not by faith. So, so again, I think there, there's some wisdom in there that I'm not going to get into today. What's your prayer fueled, fueled by? But, amen. <laughs> uh, Master, don't you care that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the, the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so afraid? Why, why don't you have any faith? Beloved, again, it almost seems unfair, except that God spent his time with these disciples working on maturity, working on for them to grow, to do what he could do. For them to do what he could do. He didn't do things just to do it for them. He did things to show them what they were, had the ability to do. He did not design us to just ask Him for everything. Oh, I, I know we have prayers, I know we have supplications, but he, he, he designed us to work by faith. Speaking to the storm, speaking to the mountain, not asking God necessarily to do it, speaking and telling it where to go. Jesus rebuked the, uh, rebuked the fear of the storm, then he rebuked the wind. Jesus was grooming his disciples to do what he did. That's why in Acts, I, I, one of the first things I see in Acts, I, I recall in Acts, is chapter 3. Silver and gold have we none, but such as we have give thy thee in the name of Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, will you please help this guy get up? Nope. Rise up and walk. They, they learned. I speak to it. I don't pray to him to come and do it. Who? Bill Johnson said this. He said, Jesus slept in the storm because the world he dwells in has no storms. That's the reality of communion with the Father. Seated in heavenly places, victory over the storms. And I'll use one more of Bill Johnson. He said, prayers of panic and fear are prayers of a servant. Prayers of authority are prayers of a son. <laughs> the disciples made their petition out of panic, not, not faith, and Jesus solves their problem. But understand here, verse 35, Jesus gave them the word that they should have been hanging on. Jesus said, we're going to the other side. They had the word. Listen, listen. This is this. I'm, we're wrapping this thing up. I know people are going. You're going a long time. Pastor. Stick with me just a few more minutes because this is going to unlock some stuff. They had the word 
in verse 35, to adjust their sails and rudders too. To use the storm to prepare them to the other side. Trials and battles from the enemies, from the enemy's perspective, is to dislodge you from God's destiny and plan, to move you away from his voice. That's why in the middle of battle, so often we go blank. What's that scripture? What did God say? When the disciples came to wake up Jesus, the furthest thing from their mind was, let's pass on to the other side. Mark chapter 4, verse 17, in the, in the parable of the seeds, the soils, he says, when, this is out of the Amplified Version, when trouble or persecution arises for the word's sake, the winds of adversity come to try to get your eyes off the word. And again, what, what did, what did, uh, what did um, Peter do? He responded to the word come. And then the storms, the winds of adversity Got his eyes off that word. When things happen, when things happen, when storms blow, when, when the enemy comes in with his, with, his, with his plans, it's to move you off of God's destiny and to get your, get your eyes off of his word. I, love, I, already, I already talked about Matthew 3 and Matthew 4. Winds of adversity are not from God, but they also don't make him nervous. Jesus was so confident in the outcome of the storm that he slept. When Jesus said, let's pass to the other side, he gave them the tool that would defeat the storm. The word will get you through the battle. Now let's go to Ephesians chapter 6 and we'll wrap it up with this. This is, this is yesterday when I got this, when I heard this, this release some things to me. Again, God's plan. God said, I know the plans I have for you. You could say it like this. I know the destiny. I know the purpose. It's a good one. It's an amazing one. The question is, are you going to get there? Are you going to allow, the, are you going to allow favor to, 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 to take you away? Are you going to... Are, are you going to Unfortunately, too many people allow the battles, the things that happen that, that you didn't think were supposed to happen that way. Or you can help, you can let those battles get you focused. So I'm telling you what, Grace Fellowship of Moorhead is going to be a healing center. I'm telling you, I'm going, we're going up. I'm not going to use anything to stop it, to, to take us back, to let us lose that. All right, all right, let me get, let me get back. Ephesians chapter 6, the armor of God. Wherefore, verse 13, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all the stand, keep standing, keep standing having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, get the shield of faith out. Now here, here's, the, here's the key. Get the shield of faith out wherewith you'll be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. That, that's that, and again, I, I know we're using different words here, but that's that wind of adversity. That's that adversity that he throws at you, those, those fiery darts, those things that are trying to take you out, trying to remove you from your destiny. And he said the, the, the shield of faith helps to quench those, to stop those from hitting you. Then he goes on, he says, verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So the sword of the Spirit is, is, again, it's the only offensive weapon that is given here. I believe that verse 18 tells us that, uh, uh, that prayer, I believe it is is, is, is another one, like pretty much the spear. But the only one that's really listed clearly is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, the enemy attacks with his darts, his arrows. 
take us out. Steal the word, steal the word, right? Stop us from our destiny. God gives us this weapon to counter his offensive attacks. Now, Ryan, a couple years ago for Christmas, asked for a sword. And uh, it was a sword off of, uh, off of one of those TV shows, uh, Game of Thrones, that is, uh, what is it, about four feet tall, Ryan? Maybe five feet? It, it, so about four feet. Four, four feet tall. All right. So, so, so it's about this big. And it's literally not one that you can just sit there and, and do the. I mean, it is not intended to do anything but to basically run people through. Because literally to, to swing it, you have one pass. And then the other guy is going to be able to do what he wants while you get control of it and come back again. It's, it's, it's a big so that's not, the, that's not the sword that they use that they're talking about. The sword that they used was what we call a two-edged sword. And matter of fact, it was just what we, I mean, just actually a little bit longer than what a dagger would be. It was not long at all because it was one that was actually, while they were regrouping, swinging that at you, they could come in and go, you know, Zorro. Just you know, swipe you several times while they're trying to regroup and then they don't get to regroup. That was the sword that they're talking about. Just a little bit thinner, a little bit longer than a dagger. Now, again, we understand the offensive part of that, but there's a, there, was a, there was a purpose that we don't hear much with, the, with that sword. Because as, often, as much as the armies were this well-tooled uh, um, machine that would get behind their shields of faith and cause the turtle tops and, and to where the arrows wouldn't come, every now and then, whether you liked it or not, Maybe there was a gap that was left open because the turtle top didn't close all the way. Maybe there was an enemy coming in from the side that you weren't ready for. An arrow got through and got you. Every now and then, arrows would get through the shield of faith to an area that wasn't covered. Perhaps they didn't see it coming. Perhaps part of their body was out of position. But it just got through. Maybe they were fully behind the shield of faith. But the enemy came in a direction they weren't ready for. Everybody, Anybody ever been there? If you let that arrow stay in there, break it off, you're going to allow affection in there. You're going to allow hurt, and it and it's still a, a mere flesh wound could end up killing you. But they had this sword that they would put that 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 sword that was a little bit longer than the dagger. They'd put it to work, and they would help them dig out that arrow, dress it, and to help it start healing. The sword. The sword of the Spirit. The same sword that is intended to take down the enemy is the same sword that will not only that, 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 will, that will take the enemy's wounds, the hurts, winds that have come to damage you and start the healing process. So that you can fulfill your destiny. And I love that picture. Because when somebody that we love, and we've had a few lately, Pastor Karen and Julie and others, when they die, we try to come up with answers. We try to figure out why. And again, with the answers that God has given me in the past, he, He's not going around going, well, they did this wrong. He's not, he's not bad enough in anybody. He's not going to give you a bunch of their, you know, maybe what happened wrong. He's just not going to do it. But if we'll allow the Word of God to start working in us, working on those wounds. I sat there on Friday night, and again, I was, I was 
uh, there's peace. There was peace in that room. I started posting on Facebook, and if it, I know there's a couple here that didn't read my post, so I'll let you read it if you want to read it. But I started posting on Facebook, and as I just posted about my sister and the fact that the reason I wanted to have my children close together like I had them was due to the friendship between Julie and I. That was the whole reason. And I look at Allison and Ryan and, and, and uh, listen to them fight and then listen to them laugh and all that kind of stuff. And I'm going, yep, I remember that. And so as I was posting that, tears started filling my eyes. And um, it, it, it hurt. It hurt. I, I know through the, when my mom passed away that there's different stages. There's times where it'll hit and times where it'll, you'll remember the good times and laugh and times that you get busy with your life. So you'll, But it hurt. And you can allow that arrow to stay in there in a sting, get infected, take off an arm, stop your destiny short, or you can take the word and understand that, you know, if Julie could, she wouldn't come back now. And we don't understand that. We cannot fathom that. For all the tea in China, we couldn't fathom that. But she wouldn't. You can take the word and pull it out and say, I still have a destiny. And I can either let this wind of adversity push me off course, or I can buckle down. And I can hold the sails. I can hold my rudder. I can use this as the thing that takes me to my destiny. It's up to us. What are you doing with your favor? What are you doing with the, with the winds of adversity? It's because it's you and what you do that determines where you go. I told you it's good. Let's stand together. Hallelujah. God is so good to us. In the middle of battles, he's so good to us. When things don't seem to be going right, he's good to us. Why? Because in the midst of the law, he's still in the midst of the of the battle, he still has said, we're going to the other side. Heavenly Father, we love you. I'm grateful for this word. This word ministered to me. It really, it did. It just, you know. You, well, you, what am I telling you about? You, you're the one that gave me the word. You're the one that directed me to hear the word. That, <laughs> But I thank you for the word. And I trust, Father, that those that in this, this congregation, this body of believers this morning will, will again just keep Keep adjusting their sails. Keep control of their rudders. Because there's a destiny that us as individuals, us as a body, Christ Fellowship of Moorhead, ministries that will spring out of Grace Fellowship of Moorhead, there's destinies to accomplish. And the enemy would love nothing more than to allow the winds of adversity to move us off of that purpose. And I know for myself, as for me and my house, we say no. We're sticking with it. We're going to buckle down even tighter, tougher than we've ever buckled down so that we can accomplish that which you've called us to accomplish. We love you, Dad. We love you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah! Whew. I love you guys so much. Go with God, walk in His blessings. Prosper, be in health, even your soul prospers. I love you. God bless you.